Welcome to your own health and fitness. I'm health integration specialist Lena Berman, and I come to you weekly to discuss self-care and integrated health. We're in the age of wireless communication. Everyone can communicate from anywhere without constraint. It's a great new world. Not only do we have cordless telephones and wireless cell phones, we have portable computers that fit into the palm of your hand. Keeping in touch with our children has never been easier. They can have cell phones, wireless email, two-way walkie-talkies. Why, even their schools are negotiating to set up LAN, or wireless land area networks, for their classrooms. How exciting. However, how much do we really know about the long-term health effects of radio frequency radiation on the developing brains and bodies of our children? Sixteen of the world's leading bio, uh, bioelectromagnetic researchers have signed a consensus statement saying that biological effects are observable and that current scientific knowledge is inadequate to set reliable exposure standards. Should we be testing these technologies on our kids? How much information are we, the consumers, getting about how and where we're being exposed to this technology? Join us in the next hour as I interview environmental consultant Cindy Sage about where we are now in the understanding of the potential risks of wireless technologies and where we need to go in order to protect our children. Let me welcome my guest, Cindy Sage. Lena, it's good to be back. Yes, indeed. It's nice to have you. Let me give you a rather long introduction. Cindy Sage is the owner of Sage Associates, which is an environmental consulting firm located in Montecito, California, Southern California. Her firm specializes in project planning where electromagnetic field issues, which we call EMF, um, and uh, visual noise and setback zones and underground, uh, lots of issues around uh, ma electromagnetic field issues for prudent, making sure that there's some prudent avoidance. Um, where they require documentation. She's been involved in electromagnetic field issues as a land use consultant and public policy researcher since 1982, and her firm specializes in land use, again, where EMF, or electromagnetic frequency, uh, computer modeling is performed to, pre to prevent setbacks, for, to predict, I'm sorry, setbacks for magnetic fields. She's provided litigation support and exp expert te uh, testimony as a witness in real estate and eminent domain actions, and, and Sage Associates con conducts home and commercial surveys of EMF and has participated in remediation of high um, uh, magnetic field environments. Ms. Sage, uh, Mrs. Sage, I'm sorry, is that correct? Mrs. Sage? It is. No. Oh, Mrs. Mrs. Sage has, pro I don't know why I didn't know that, has provided professional consulting services to cities, counties, various states and a national EMF policy group on the issue of EMF policy and prudent uh, avoidance. I should also mention that she has numerous publications and invited presentations in, in the area of EMF public policy. Um, and she is the author of a huge list of articles. And these are all articles, I think, not books. Are these books as well? No books yet, Lena. Okay. And um, recently at the International Conference on Wireless Antenna Siting, or Sitting, I should say, in Salzburg, uh, Germany, in, in June of 2000 this year, she presented two papers on science and public health policy related to radio frequency radiation from cell phone antennas. She's an associate member of the Bioelectromagnetics Society. Welcome again. Lena, thanks very much. It might, you know, we just done this introduction, it might help people if we uh, sort of unpack some of these terms we just used, like RFR, you know, radio frequency radiation, and EMF, and microwave, and, you know, because these will come up in, in our conversation today, and it might be that it, it would be good to explain what we mean by those terms. Right. Well, uh, EMF, or electromagnetic fields, is usually the, the tagline that people use when they want to refer to um, 60 hertz power, uh, meaning electricity and all the impacts that come along with uh, the use of electricity. Uh, when you talk about RFR, or radio frequency radiation, it is a subset of EMF. And why it's important to us to talk about is that that is the kind of, of non-ionizing radiation that is put out by all kinds of devices that, that are coming into use, uh, cell phones, cordless phones and um, 
as we're going to talk about today, we're now looking at a whole new generation of, of devices, many of them for school kids, uh, that also produce lower levels of radio frequency radiation. And we have some real question about whether or not we have enough information to understand whether or not this is going to create a healthy um, school environment for kids. Uh, as you just pointed out, we seem to be rushing ahead with this technology with limited research on long-term exposure and very little regulation of the industry. So I, I would like your opinion about what's going on, and, and, and I'd like to know what you, you would like to see, uh, who and who you'd like to see included in regulatory decisions. Right. Well, you know, um, I divide this up in, into what I call the big questions, and, and then not that they're little questions, but the more personal questions that we need to ask when we think about using wireless devices or being putting ourselves in environments where uh, radio frequency radiation from other people's devices is going to be significant. But, you know, the big questions that we really have to face are, are primarily these. Have we made or are we making an irrevocable commitment to a wireless world before we even understand what the potential risks are going to be to human health and specifically to the human genome? Um, we're talking about a very, very large question here. Uh, radio frequency radiation at low levels, much lower than, than current standards allow, has been shown to break DNA and or to interfere with DNA repair. That is monkeying with the human genome, with our DNA. Um, are we making a commitment to a wireless world in a completely uninformed way and without any kind of public debate on this? Is it only the industry that is moving forward and making these choices, uh, or are we to have a voice in this? And this is a global issue, uh, not just a, a, a local or state or national issue. Um, again, we might want to roll back for a second because we're talking about radio frequency radiation. You've explained how it's different from electromagnetic fields. One one thing we might mention is that we're not talking, people get confused about the kind of radiation that comes from uh, radio transmissions, actually, like we're doing right now, like right. our towers, um, and the type of radio frequency radiation that comes out of wireless telephones and and the antennas that they provide is there uh, do you want to explain the difference well you know i i think it's probably wise to say that that all of these sources of radio frequency radiation really are along a spectrum and you know am radio fm radio and television are down in the the low uh, megahertz uh, or million hertz uh, frequencies and uh, you're looking at 100 200 300 megahertz range when we're talking about cell phones, we've jumped up to the 8 to 900 megahertz range, and uh, the newer generations of cell phones are going to be working at up to 1,000 megahertz, which suddenly becomes a 1 gigahertz. So if you hear a 2 gig or a 3 gig you know, tag on the end of a, a, you know, the brochure selling you a, a brand new cell phone, what you're looking at is the upper spectrum that we use for communication with radio frequency. Now, the upper range is microwave, the lower range is not, but these are fairly artificial, um, you know, divisions. I think what's really important to, to go back to is to, to understand that the evolving uh, literature coming from health studies is showing that we have possible uh, cancer-causing or carcinogenic effects across the entire spectrum that I've just discussed, from AMFM TV up through the two to three gig range for communications. But at higher levels. Well, they're higher frequencies. Higher frequencies, I mean. In other words, what I'm saying is what I don't want to have happen is last time I had you on the show, I got we all got phone calls saying um, that uh, KPFA, uh, being a radio station, was creating a danger to people because of the radio frequency. You know what I'm saying? So I'd like to, okay, so you're laughing. You hear she's laughing, so please don't call me about this. Um, so do, do, but do you understand what my, what, my, what my point is here? Well, you know, today I, you know, I'm really prepared to talk with you about, you know, the, the radio frequency, microwave frequencies that are, are more related to uh, uh, cell phones, cordless phones, and then this new generation of uh, wireless communications. And probably, if we want to talk about AM, FM, and radio, we should do that another day. It's a whole literature unto itself. All I'm trying to point out is that we're talking about uh, most of the studies that are alarming 
mm-hmm. are at higher frequencies. Well, that's only partly true. But again, it's um, it's it's a wide literature, and uh, the, the the major point to make is that we, you know, we wish we had more of it at all of these frequencies. But certainly, there is adequate evidence now to be very cautious about our exposures to these higher frequencies that uh, are related to wireless communication and, and to wireless Internet. Okay. Um, as I pointed out in, in, in the beginning of as I started to talk about why we were here, um, the last time that we talked, we were really just trying to outline for people. This, we were trying to cover this whole issue, and we, we sort of talked about where we were at in terms of research. Now what we're finding is that the industry is specifically targeting child consumers, and schools. Right. right. So I want to I go over what we do know so far. I want to get more specific about what we know so far that is causing concerns within the scientific community in terms of traceable health effects, uh, both on children and adults. Good. Well, you know, for the Salzburg uh, talks, we here at the office updated the literature um, that we provide to people who have concerns about what the studies are showing and there are a number of new studies. Uh, unfortunately, all of these now have been on adults. Um, we'll talk about kids next. But uh, the new studies that have looked at the use of um, uh, you know, uh, devices that emit radio frequency radiation are uh, providing some very worrisome um, results. For example, uh, a couple, I'm just going to mention a couple of them, but uh, one of them done um, by Salford and, and Person, uh, a couple of European researchers, is showing pathological changes uh, in the blood-brain barrier, which protects your brain from toxins that come in from the outside, with um, very, very low levels of radio frequency radiation in the 900 megahertz range, which is related to cell phone uh, frequencies. And and also related to cordless phones now. Cordless phones are 900 megahertz as well. That's right. And uh, if you look at the levels, these levels are you know, the levels at which we're seeing um, very adverse changes in the blood-brain barrier are occurring you know, below what any cell phone produces today and probably in the range of many cordless phones. So because these are adult studies, uh, what does that say for children? Well, we have evidence from other studies that indicates that kids' heads, because of their size, actually absorb more radio frequency radiation in the 8 to 900 megahertz range. If you were to look at a photograph or a, a diagram of an adult head talking on the phone, you would see that the amount of radio frequency radiation that penetrates into the, the skull and the brain is probably an eighth of the head. But if you look at a 10-year-old child, it's probably a quarter of the head. And if you look at a 5-year-old child on that same phone call, you're looking at, oh, gosh, um, a third or more of, of the skull and the brain area. So kids absorb more. And um, in addition to it, uh, you know, kids are still forming their, you know, their tissues. They're still growing. And many researchers believe that the effects on children are going to be more significant in more ways. You gave me a um, rather complete uh, grouping of abstracts of the studies that are out there, and the blood-brain barrier is one of mm. innumerable mm-hmm. things. What um, else happens? <laughs> yeah, why don't you go ahead and, and take yeah. some time. Let me quickly ID the show so you have some freedom to just go ahead. This is Your Own Health and Fitness. I'm Lena Berman, and, and I have by phone Cindy Sage, who is an environmental consultant specializing in electromagnetic field radiation and radio frequency radiation uh, assessment. Um, she's returned recently from Germany where there was a large meeting, a scientific meeting, where she did a presentation. And we're, we're trying to update people on the specific information that we is, is available now, including the fact that children are very aggressively being uh, targeted by the industry and uh, what, that, what the significance of that could be. So uh, we'll continue on. Right. <clears throat> well, blood-brain barrier effects are have now been replicated. Uh, that means that they have been shown to occur in a number of repeated studies, so it looks like those effects are real. Um, uh, other effects that have been shown recently are confirmations that uh, when, you, when you hit the head with uh, really fairly low radio frequency radiation, you're producing heat shock proteins. And heat shock proteins are, are a good thing in some cases. It's what happens to the body when you stress it. 
and heat shock proteins sort of go into action to protect us from further damage once we've had an, an, an initial environmental insult. Uh, we're seeing now that RFR exposure produces the equivalent of, of that that would be produced with a 3 degree centigrade heating of tissue, but there is no heating occurring, and that's very important. It isn't a physical heating, but these microwaves appear to give, you know, the equivalent dose of heat shock protein or stress. And this is a, a very good measure that the body is both registering and reacting to microwave radiation. And again, at levels that are perhaps in the 5 to, to 10 microwatt per centimeter squared range. And that's going to be important later, Lena, when we talk about what some of these devices and some of these school environments would be like with wireless built in. Okay, now you just used the term radio, radio, radio frequency radiation and microwave in the, sort of the same mm -hmm. sentence. In this case, they are. We're talking about frequencies that, that are, are microwave within the RFR spectrum. Okay. Okay? Uh, other things that we're seeing are uh, effects on uh, DNA and DNA repair, which are, are direct damage. And uh, we don't like that because that causes cancer. Well, it can. Yeah, yeah. It definitely can. And uh, what, what, you, what you want to avoid, and unfortunately what we're seeing, is an increase in both single and double strand breaks of DNA. And DNA is our chromosomes, so this is not a good thing. And or we're seeing a failure to repair. You know, DNA, DNA constantly breaks and, and is repaired on its own, but imperfect repair can, can set up the conditions that ultimately can lead to cancer. And that, that's any kind of cancer not just one kind or, or two kinds. So we're looking, at, uh, we're looking at those effects, but I think importantly for people with kids, one of the things that has, has now been made fairly clear from the, the new literature is that kids are affected in behavioral ways and in ways that affect memory and learning with very low level exposures to chronic or you know day-to-day -day constant radio frequency radiation. And this is the last thing that we want to do to kids in schools when you think about it. Now, you're, you're, um, you're citing actual research uh, projects, the studies, mm -hmm. the clinical studies that have been done. Right. Um, and why, why don't you go, go ahead and ta talk about the, um, the types of symptoms that we're seeing in children? Well, the, um, there's a sort of a standard set of... Um, of things that are reported to occur with microwave radiation illness. It's actually, it's actually got a name in many European countries, but they would include memory loss or short-term memory deficit, uh, slowed motor skills and reaction time in children, uh, spatial disorientation, uh, the inability to find your way somewhere or, or to wake up and, and not remember where you were going or find you're going the wrong way. Uh, headaches are, are just, you know, constantly reported uh, in, in the literature. Uh, loss of concentration and fuzzy thinking, which we think is related again to changes in, uh, uh, you know, neurotransmitters within the brain and electrical activity changes in the brain. But um, and then you and then you jump to some other sort of major systems in the body that don't relate to, uh, you know, to the, you know neurology. Uh, we're looking at increased heart rate or cardiac changes. Uh, we're seeing increased blood pressure reported in some cases, decreased blood pressure reported in other cases. So this just means that we need to look a lot more at, at the effect of, on the vascular system. Well, now, those body. are studies that are done on adults, is that correct? That's correct. Actually, you know, so th th this is, is pretty much a mix now, Lena, because we just don't have great studies done yet on children. We have very few. Okay, so we, we have anecdotal uh, reports of children having um, sort of brain symptoms, cognitive symptoms, and right. some physical symptoms. Right. Right. Um, and are we talking about these symptoms occurring on children in a school environment where they're exposed to wireless communication devices, or are we talking about exposure, maybe it's and or, to antennas? Well, <clears throat> the, uh, the, one of the studies that's most interesting here uh, that is specifically on children and uh, specifically related to radio frequency radiation, but not necessarily to these new systems, these are probably related to a mix of RF in the environment, were done by Chang in uh, China. And uh, she is a researcher who is continuing to provide information on children specifically. And she's finding these changes, uh, slowed motor skills and uh, slowed reaction time and um, 
uh, changes in visual reaction in children uh, and lower memory function in the 4 to 15 microwatt per centimeter squared range, which is, again, a very low level of chronic exposure. Nevertheless, it's the same level of exposure that we're going to see in some of these new land systems that are being proposed for schools. So where are these kids getting exposed? Where are they getting exposed? Do we know? Well, in, uh, in, in her experiments, there, were, there would be a, a combination probably of uh, broadcast uh, radio frequency and cellular communication frequency there, although probably less of it, and possibly some radar. So again, it's, it's the environmental mix that they get. That would be in and around their school. That's right. Okay. Now, um, you know, people argue that the, st- the studies are inconclusive, and it does look as though some of the studies on brain tumors and, and maybe cancer look a little bit inconclusive. Uh, some of the studies are done on animals instead of, you know, because the, the, the study is, is ongoing. On people. Yeah, it's happening now. <laughs> We're experimenting on people now. Um, so what do, you, what do you say to people in response to this? Because I've had people who are very astute scientifically, people who read, who are intelligent, who look at the studies, and they say, well, it's inconclusive. Well, you know, I think we really need to, to, to ask immediately, what do they mean by that? Um, inconclusive, any, there's no one study that is ever going to nail this effect either occurring or not occurring. It is the weight of the evidence that accumulates over time that we need to evaluate. There will always be some studies that don't show effect, and it may be because they had poor study design, they had small populations, the researchers didn't know what they were doing. There, there are a lot of reasons it can happen, and when you add those in to a number of positive studies, there are some people who will say this means that the results of, of the entirety of the literature is inconclusive. I think that that's not a, that's not a productive way to look at this from a public health point of view. Well, it also sounds like not all the studies are inconclusive, that many of the studies are conclusive. They are fairly clear Well, in terms of showing a, a, a physical or neurological effect. Right. Well, you know, in, in the listing of studies that we've done, we only select those that, are, that have statistically significant findings and, and we produce those in, in the, the quick charts that we do because those studies have already met the test, which is defined in the science as being 95% certain that they are not occurring uh, due to random error or, uh, you know, uh, coincidence. So we, we have a fairly heavy screen to, to rule out those that have weak findings. And, you know, what's important, again, is to look across the weight of the evidence. We have many positive studies that would not be occurring if something wasn't going on. And, yeah, we do have some negative studies. But, um, you know, the, the scientific argument is, is should not be that we have to wait for conclusive scientific evidence when absolutely everything is known about the issue in order to take some interim action or to make some choices that would be protective, particularly of children. Okay. Now, what you sent me is considerable amount of you sent me a considerable number of abstracts. So, so there's a quite a, quite a lot of of um, material, and this is from the Salzburg, oh Austria, not Germany, mm-hmm. Salzburg um, conference. Uh, it, it so we've got the effects on DNA, we've got a chromosome aberrations, um, effects on the way the body responds. to well, that's more complicated. Um, I'm not going to go over that. It's too complicated. Uh, changes the ornithine, the yeah, the ornithine thing. Gene transcription, stress response, um, cellular effects, immune system responses, blood-brain barrier, blood pressure, reproductive tract, cancer, and brain symptoms, and psychoactive drugs being interfered with. Right. You know, Lena, I, I have to say this for people. You know, um, Radio frequency radiation in hospitals is going to be another big issue. Oh, um, boy. Today we're going to talk about schools, I think, more or less, and, you know, kids and back to school. But, you know, in a hospital, more and more hospitals are thinking about going to these, you know, land systems, land area networks. And some of the things that can happen with radio frequency radiation exposure, uh, it makes the nervous system less susceptible to uh, the paralysis-like drugs that they give you in anesthesia mm. to paralyze patients during surgery. This is a very bad thing. This would be bad, yeah. It also, it also has the, the effect of making drugs like Valium and Librium more potent in the body. So it interferes with your ability to dose people correctly. And it's, um, you know, unfortunately, 
Um, RFR interacts apparently with the endogenous opioid system, and that is the system that has lots to do with things that can, you know, they're, they're, they, have, they have to do with, the, you know, psychoactive drugs. They have to do with neurotransmitter function. And these are things that you don't want to really mess with in a hospital environment. And yet hospitals are becoming more wireless in their operation than almost any other institution. Which is great because they're also very chemically, ter- they're horrible for people who are sensitive to chemicals as well. Yeah. So it becomes, well, and then just to finish off the list, I mean, in addition, for hospitals, these neurological effects are not a happy thing. And then we've got serotonin being affected, yeah. uh, eye damage, behavioral changes, learning and memory, cognitive, sleep being affected. And again, let me just say that these are abstracts that Cindy has sent me that are from the International Conference on Cell Tower Sitting in Salzburg, Austria. So this is an assemblage of um, scientists. Well, presenting these, papers. Actually, actually, you know, these are all abstracts that uh, we provided to the conference. As a oh, you provided. The, they weren't. They weren't. Uh, these weren't papers that were being pre- presented. No, but, and there, but there were many more that were pre- presented. Uh-huh. Some of these in the citing conference had to do, again, reinforcing the notion that um, RFR interferes with sleep, RFR interferes with um, uh, neurological activity and so on and uh, certainly the there there was a strengthening of belief at that conference that um, the literature is becoming very sufficient to be concerned okay um we're going to break shortly um i think what we're going to spin off to a bit here is to try to talk a little more about what to expect in terms of what our children are going to be because we're going to sort of single out uh children and, and the effect on children um, I think it is significant, as I said in the opening, that this group of, of scientists who specialize in the industry have come out with a consensus that they've all signed, saying this is not, we're not ready yet, this is, there's stuff that needs to be looked at, there's a problem here. So I think that that's also significant for the naysayers. Um, and obviously the big push for this is because uh, there's so much money to be made by doing this well, without without because these studies now finally are not being done by the industry these are studies that are aren't they in, more independent well you know that th- that that's another show in itself but did you know that the market cap for the four major companies cell cell phone companies alone is 472 billion dollars because of march of this year and uh you know there's there's a huge amount of money at stake and and new markets to be developed and where we're seeing the market go now is, uh, you know, phones are common. Now we're going to go to, uh, you know, a wireless airport, a wireless school, a wireless hospital, and wireless toys, wireless cars. And, uh, again, if you just ask yourself a simple question, what is my radio frequency radiation exposure likely to be if I'm in a school like that, if I'm in a job at a school like that, if I'm a staff or a faculty person? If I buy this toy for my kids, what's the ex- what's the exposure going to be like? And can I find out? Yeah. And, and what, if I do find out, what does it mean? Okay. So, so we'll go on from there. That's uh, We're listening to Cindy Sage. She's on the phone uh, from Southern California with me, environmental consultant specializing in radio frequency radiation issues. I'm Lena Berman. This is your own health and fitness. Uh, we'll come back with this discussion about wireless technologies and what effect they may have on your children in about 30 seconds. Now just because we're kids, because we're sort of small, because we're small. Now just because your throat has got a deeper voice and lots of wind to blow it out. And little kids who don't dare shout, you have no right, you have no right to boss and beat us little kids about. Welcome back. This is your own health and fitness. I'm health integrationist Lena Berman on the phone with environmental consultant Cindy Sage from Sage Associates, who is a uh, specializing in both radio frequency radiation, cell and wireless communication radiation, and um, electromagnetic radiation issues. Uh, who's reporting some on the International Conference on S- Cell Tower Siting in Salzburg, Aust- Austria, that happened in June. And in addition, we're, we're specializing on, we're sort of honing in on, on what effect and what kinds of implications there are now for children, developing children's brains and whatnot. Um, 
if you miss part of today's show and you want to get a tape, I do have taped uh, copies available, not transcripts. You can always call me at 24 hours a day at the information number 707-773-4727. And while we're at it, Cindy, I'm thinking that people are going to want to know how to get their hands on some of these studies. Is there a way to do that? You bet. Yeah. Um, at the end, of, whenever you like, we can give a. Um, let's do it twice. Side for us. Okay. Let's do it twice. You can find uh, a lot of this information going up uh, as we speak on our website, and that website is www.silcom s i l c o m dot com forward slash tilde little tilde sign there on your laptop, and then sage s a g e forward slash EMF. Til- the tilde on a, uh, at least on a Macintosh keyboard, is on the far left, sort of off the lettered keys. Uh, on the upper left, there's a key that has uh, two two things, and one of them on the shift key is the tilde. The little wavy squiggly line. Squiggly thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So do, do it one more time. www.silcom, S-I-L-C-O-M, dot com, forward slash, tilde, Sage S A G E forward slash E M F. Okay, so so if you're if you're really wanting to get your hands on some of these studies to read for yourself, uh, some of them will be there. That's right. Did you want to give out a phone number for the office in case? I mean, I well, think let's we do this. Let's give them an email address, and anybody who would like to have specific information, we'll try and get back to you. Uh, you can reach us at Sage S A G E at Silcom.com, S-I-L-C-O-M dot com. Okay, you're going to be deluged. Uh, uh, no, we, you know, we're one of the few places you can get a lot of information that we've had to really scrabble for. And uh, I want to tell you a story about how hard it was to get some of this, Lena, because I figure that, you know, I'm a mom, and there are a lot of moms and a lot of dads out there that are probably asking the same questions I am. I mean, they're 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 questions that are relevant to life, and. Uh, the way, the way that I, I got involved in uh, this, this questioning about what the heck is it? What's, what's an airport? You know, what is this catalog I got in the mail? I got a Mac Zone catalog. We do almost all of our office and, and home ordering. You know, out of a great you know business called Mac Zone, yeah. and they send a catalog. And the one that arrived this September is called the Back to School Specials. <laughs> <laughs> and I looked at it and I thought, okay, well, let's see what's, what's in this for me. Um, if you turn to page five, this is the this is where I I would go first because this has got all the new Apple stuff in it, and we're a dedicated uh, Mac company here because we do a lot of graphics. But uh, what you're going to see in the middle of page five is again the key to my questioning: What does this mean, and what is this like, and what do we know about it, and can you get good information? And this has been going on uh, three or four months now to try to bring your your listeners some information about RFR levels for kids. Anyway, the ad says, Freedom to Roam, uh, Airports for All. In addition to iBooks, now the new PowerBooks, iMacs, and PowerMac G4s all have an airport slot built in. And just briefly, what, it, what, a, what a slot is like this is a, it's a little add-on to a computer that allows you to go wireless. Okay? It means that you don't have to have a cord. Yeah, but it also sounds like it means you don't need to have a battery in your computer the way you do normally, right? Well, I don't know about that. Um, okay. But it just says that you can do all of the normal things you do without plugging in cables. Right. I don't know if there's a backup battery in it or not, but uh, I'll tell you, last year's models didn't have airports, and this, this year's do. So, you know, now that these are being advertised directly to kids and for kids, I called up uh, MacZone, and I talked to my you know marketing rep, and I said, hey, can you call these folks and find out for me what kind of RFR levels would my child have if they were using an airport? And he called and he called and he called. And Apple just completely threw up a wall of silence. First wouldn't respond and then finally said, we don't give out this kind of information. Oh, Period. God. Period. They didn't say we don't know. They said we don't give it out. Right. We hope they don't know. I mean, you know what I mean? I mean, it's almost better if, well... Let's just think it's bad either way. Um, we didn't even get the standard. We meet federal guidelines. Oh, God. Or federal standards. It's terrifying. It's terrifying. So I called. Mm. Actually, I didn't do this. I had our, our, our great rep at Maxon call. But you couldn't get this information on similar 
uh, equipment from IBM, from 3Com, from Cisco, from Apple. And those are the ones I can remember we checked. And so it made me very curious to know whether or not we were in a territory where they're so fearful of having this information used and compared to some of the health studies showing low-level effects and particularly effects on kids that they just didn't want it out before they'd sold a bundle. Um, so this is what this is this is one this is one link in 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 the looking. Well, let's let's look at that link that you just said because it brings up this issue of what is wireless technology and where are we getting exposed? Because this issue of Palm Pilots, I think a lot of people assume that there's a battery in your your device, and gee, I don't know, isn't that like a you know like a uh, flashlight or something? I mean, what's the big deal? So. I think that people are very ignorant in terms of understanding what it means to be wireless and where the frequency is coming from, where the radiation is coming from. Right. Well, you know, I, I'm not an engineer, and I, I won't I attempt to explain. Part of part of this information is probably proprietary anyway, but there are a number of um, um, engineers and designers that have developed things that have names. There are names like Range, L-A-N, Range LAN, or Roam, R-O-A-M, Roam LAN, and others like it. And what they are what they are talking about are technologies that allow you to to run around the country with one of these handheld devices or a laptop and be able to take information literally out of the air. What's happening is that radio frequency radiation is being broadcast from somewhere by them and and it is available to you the user with a special airport uh, configuration in your new device, for example, in, a, in an iMac. Um, other devices are going to have other ways of extracting the RF out of the air. But the point is that it requires whoever is selling this to you to have r additional levels of radio frequency radiation in the air so that wherever you go, you can pick up the signal. Okay, so there are two questions I have about this. One is that does it matter whether you have a Palm Pilot in your hand, how much radiation you're going to be exposed to, or are we all just being exposed to it and bombarded with it no matter what because it's out there in these antennas and places that are radiating it? Right. Well, let me give you some examples. And again, these are the ones that we've been able to, to glean from some very, some very persistent work, and we don't have complete information yet. But for um, one of the LAN systems, and I'm, I should explain that again, LAN means Land Area Network. A wireless LAN is a system that allows people to, again, take information out of the air in a wireless fashion within a zone that is determined by, you know, how big the zone is about where you can get information depends on how big the terminal is that's sending it out. In a school, they would have an antenna mounted somewhere probably within, oh, I think for one of the LAN systems we looked at, the, the range was about 33 feet. So this particular LAN system would be able to serve wireless laptops within about 30 feet, okay? Now, when you ask yourself, okay, so within that 30-foot uh, diameter, what is the radio frequency radiation load extra from this? And the answer is that it's somewhere between maybe 5 and 10 microwatts per centimeter squared. So what does that, <laughs> so what does that number mean? Well, you know, we were seeing uh, earlier, we were talking about changes uh, in memory and learning and uh, visual reaction time in children and changes in immune function at the 4 to 15 microwatt per centimeter squared range. So we're right in there. Okay, but we're, we're, we're just to differentiate this. We've got, we've got these LAN situations where people are in certain areas where they're able to, and, it, and, and that is scary because they're talking about doing this to schools airports, hospitals. Right. And I see here that 3Com Park is going wireless so you can order hot dogs mm -hmm. and get your statistics faster, um, but then you're going to be, as you put it, waiting around in an RFR-laden airspace. Exactly. So, yeah. But okay, so then there's those of us who just say, well, I'm not going to 3Com Park, and I don't fly very much, and I'm not in, I mean, I'm worried about my kids, and I want to, you know, you know, whatever. But, but, but what about... As I said, this there's now this deluge of new products. I mean, there are laptops. My understanding is that when you unplug a laptop, you have a limited amount of time on the battery that you have in the laptop that you can use. And that isn't wireless. That's different. That's using That's your battery. Different. Okay. Yeah. Then you've got Palm Pilots, at, which you list as, you know, these wireless communication things that pick up Internet. Right. So, 
So where where do we differentiate? Is it only when you're in an LAN area that you're at risk, well, at higher risk, or or is it the case that all of these products, because you also list some daunting, a daunting list of products that are being marketed to children now, right. like these well, let's put the walkie-talkies pilot, and yeah, stuff. Let's put the Palm Pilot aside, I think, and talk about things for kids, um, because the, the targeting of kids uh, is, uh, again, uh, a very clear um, well, well, let's not let's not put the Palm Pilot away until we g- give people some kind of answer. I mean, should people be as concerned about Palm Pilots as they are about cellular phones? Well, you know, I guess, Lena, if I had better information on it, I'd, I'd feel more... Well, no, that's honest. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd feel better about giving information, but we haven't actually gone down that trail yet to okay. find out what their emissions are like. Okay. And we have on a lot of these others for kids. Okay, so let's talk about the kids' stuff. Yeah, yeah. Like the um, 900 cordless phone from Disney with Mickey Mouse. Yeah. Well, a 900 megahertz cordless phone is going to be producing something on the order of uh, 25 or 30 microwatts per centimeter squared at the earpiece, and that uh, that may actually that may actually be higher as you walk further away from that little base that it sits in, the little cradle, because it has to work harder as you move further away from it. But once you're talking about field levels at that point, you're already up in the area where you have nervous system activity changes, changes in blood, changes in DNA, uh, certainly changes in memory and attention. So those are among probably the highest, other, other than the, uh, the two-way walkie-talkies, which are, again, a very high. Interesting, too, high because high. that's really getting popular right now, is that people are using walkie-talkies when they go to a business, you know, go someplace recreational with their kids. Right. Well, it's, you know, in the old days, people just kept an eye on their kids. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> now the ads say, you know, why walk upstairs? Send mom an email and do it wirelessly. And so this email Don't stuff. Don't shout upstairs. Right. <laughs> so even these, like, the, there's this e- email, there's a V-mail, which is in a, um, like, a writing pen, it's almost like. It's this little, or these little tiny instruments that are wireless where you can do email type things. There's a 900 megahertz pen that gives you V-mail for kids. So right. Can, so these no, are these true. are high frequencies, huh? Yeah. Well, any 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 child that wants to send a friend a, a wireless message with a quick writer or a Cybico or a V-mail can send up to anywhere from maybe 30 to 100 feet away. That's the range of RFR that this works on. And um, you know th- th- what they're doing is creating the same kind of um, radiation pattern that you would with secondhand radiation from a cell phone, basically. The low the, the levels are a little lower, but certainly. Anywhere it works, you've created a higher RFR level. Well, now we've just moved on to the next issue, which is secondhand radiation. So <laughs> we're on the plane, or kids are sitting next to somebody, and they're using um, they're using their computer on the airplane, or they're talking on a cell phone. And what you've done here is to create a situation which one day we may recognize as as a, as a harmful exposure. We all know what secondhand smoke is. We definitely can, we, we can measure the secondhand radiation zone, if you want to call it that, around people that are using cell phones or cordless phones. Well, tell us about that. Yeah. If you're, a, if you're using a, a typical cell phone, let's say in a restaurant, and uh, you've got people sitting at, you know, at a table for four, every person that you're sitting with is exposed to elevated RFR and probably the people immediately behind you. If you're standing in line, it's the same thing. So how mu- what kind of distance is it? How far away? I mean, like if I'm in the in the video store and somebody s- flips out their their cell phone because they're going to have a conversation about which film to take home. How far should I walk away from this person? <laughs> well, actually, you probably uh, ought to ask for a cell cell phone free zone in every area that you go if you well, care about. Well, that's very phone. yeah. That's that that would be nice. But in the meantime, well, three or three or five feet on on you know. Uh, on one end, and again, if that cell phone is having to work very hard to reach a cell site so it's operating at its highest power, it might be five or eight feet. So if you see somebody going, what, what, you go running in the opposite direction, <laughs> go as far away as you can. And the only and the only consolation is knowing that they're getting a whopping amount of radiation in their head for right. bad behavior right. in public. Right. Of course, <laughs> you know, it's I, this is very vicious, but I, I think some people will laugh. It may be even be happy that I'm this vicious, but... Um, I had a girlfriend who said this, so I can sort of lay it off on her, but she used to say the problem with smokers is that they don't die fast enough okay. because they're smoking. This is when they were, I know, my, my engineer is going, oh, jeez, did you really say that? You know, meaning like in the old days when people were smoking in restaurants, you know, you'd think, you know, the problem is if they would just drop dead in their mashed potatoes, you wouldn't be exposed to the cigarette smoke. So right, right. 
but, but anyway, that's vicious. Um, the other thing, I suppose, though, is you could just put a whopping great piece of, of mashed potatoes or whatever on your fork or on your spoon and sort of lob it over to the person well, on the <laughs> cell phone. <laughs> this whole business of, you know, etiquette is one thing, and, and the industry is trying to, uh, you know, put out lists of things that you shouldn't do, you know, to, you know, that annoy people, you know, the etiquette. Well, but the other thing is if you're sitting in a theater yeah. and they've asked you to turn the, so, so that you're not making noise, the question is, are you sitting in an ocean of people who may have these things on a mute or a vibrator thing? Are you still, are they still radiating to you when you're sitting oh, here? absolutely. Yeah, as long as the yes, phone is on. Yes, is that a yes? Oh, yeah. As long Ooh. as the phone is on, it's sending a signal back and forth to the nearest cell site. It won't be quite as high as when they're actually talking or even worse. And the worst time for radiation is when they're initiating a call, when it's ringing through. That is the time you don't want to hold it to your head and you don't want to be near them. But... Um, you know, this business about, I, you know, we've all heard now the industry is coming out and, and saying, you know, we care about your safety. Don't mm. use a cell phone when, you know, you're getting on to, you know, on, onto a freeway on-ramp or, you know, you can see there's trouble ahead. Well, I'm talking about distraction. But you know what? The, um, I mean, talk about, you know, chaos and advertising. Uh, the L.A. Times, July 31st, 2000, business section has an article about automakers taking the high-tech road and all the, the recent car gadgets they're, they're advertising, back-to-back -back with this warning from the industry not to talk on the phone and drive when you're upset and not to take notes and not to, you know, do the certain things. <laughs> Get this. <clears throat> the latest Cadillac, Jaguar, and other innovators in the auto industry are offering dashboard units that allow right. drivers to do these things. Play CDs and CD-ROMs. Use flash memory cards. Give me a break. They should have flash memory cards that say, look at the road <laughs> now. These guys are... Grasp crazy. the steering wheel. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine? Here, Henry Lai is, is showing that, you know, the memory function, you know, dissipates when you're, on, when you're exposed to cell phone radio frequency radiation. And here, car guys are trying to sell you devices that allow you to try to memorize things as you're driving. Does this make sense? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, and this is, until we can until we can beamed be beamed places, I think this is well, really. Well, <clears throat> you know, Lena, it brings up another issue. Mm. If if you buy one of these cars that has the new radar in it, that mm. allows you to hear a little voice in your car saying you're going to hit something. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a, that's one of these new car gadget options. That means your car is automatically sending out and receiving radar information. Mm. Again, creating an impact outside of your car, meaning to other people, just as a cell phone would in, the, in a crowd, mm. and you're getting the benefit for it. So there's an awful lot of uneven distribution of impacts to people who may not want to be in any elevated radio frequency field at all. Mm. Well, mm. Uh, do you want to talk a bit about, um, in relationship to children and adults, exposure to antennas and things like that? Do you want to make any mention? I mean, I think we've sort of woven it into the discussion, but I sense that people are going to want to know more specifics about that because there's not much you can I mean these there are fights that go on I know there was one recently in a small town in Marin County where they were fighting about and you were there you went there and did a, an assessment about uh, towers and things well you know universally people uh, appear now to be objecting to the location of cell towers near their homes schools and offices and more and more their 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 opinions are weighing in but, you know, Lena, what do you think about trying to, to, you know, kids going back to school here and you've got parents, you know, now wondering, well, what is, is my school going to use one of these new wireless LAN systems and what questions should I ask? Yep. I mean, these are the things to me that naturally would come out of this discussion. Okay. Um, you know, what do you ask? First of all, you know, you have power in your local school district more than you have it at the World Health Organization level. So go ask these questions and start generating interest in knowing the answers and don't let them off the hook. Ask your school district if they plan to use a new wireless LAN system or if they're investigating it. And if so, what levels of radio frequency radiation would the children be exposed to? And would that be in every classroom? You know, is there going to be a choice? Are there safer options? I think people should know that, you know, fiber optic or cable wiring is, is uh, equal or better in, in many cases for uh, providing the same service. So it's not like your kid doesn't get Internet if they don't go for this. It's just plugged in. Yeah, yeah. And it is, I think it is the case that when parents get involved and, and are assertive with school districts, it often does, because, I mean, they can't, you know, th if there's too much pressure put to bear, it makes them very uncomfortable. So it's Right. Well, school districts ought to, ought, if they're not already worried, they ought to be worried about putting out 
big bucks for new systems, only to find that the you know the purveyor didn't tell them anything about potential radio frequency health effects. And then uh, there, people are doubly mad because you're stuck with a system you had to pay for and install, and now you want it out because it turns out that the, you know kids are exposed to high levels of RFR, particularly where there's an alternative for it. Do you want to say something about uh, the cell towers in school? I mean, that's related to what yeah. you're saying. Is just go after the school district and say, don't don't buy this. Well, you know, once you, once a school starts a discussion on radio frequency issues, it, the cell towers on school property, you know, that issue is going to come up. And you ought to ask your school district whether or not they have a policy on wireless now. And if they don't, they ought to have one. And it ought to be developed with full knowledge of what we do know and don't know about health effects at this point in time. Um, some school districts have been approached to put a tower up and make a little money, which they all like to do. But you, they really need to investigate health effects first and decide if it's worth the risk and the disclosure requirements you'd have and whether or not, um, you know, this is an idea that really passes muster with the PTA and faculty and staff. Is there a responsible use of cordless wireless technology? Oh, sure. You know, there are, there are good insurance policy of uh, you know, if, if you break down somewhere in a car and you have a, a, a cell phone, you can call for help, and, and that's that's a pretty great idea. But remember that any any telephone call over about two minutes is already starting to have impact on brain and brain activity. Now, of course, it's better to have um, a headset and have the phone away from your head and stuff. Right. Yeah. Try to try not to get that antenna close to your head if you have a choice. And you can you oh maybe we should point out that as of about a month ago. Um, most cellular companies now are going to post information on the amount of radiation that their phones produce. Mm -hmm. And today the Wall Street Journal had, uh, uh, thanks to, to Bob Cooley, who's one of our listeners, um, I have a copy of a cell phone article that talks about Nokia and Ericsson and Motorola posting cell phone um, SARs or measures of their, uh, their radiation. But... Um, it's also curious they're going to put the SAR material in the box. <laughs> so oh, you have to. Well, you, these things are returnable, you know. You, you can buy them. <laughs> but you know, they the, most of these companies that sell them will take them back. Um, it's too bad that they all went digital too, because the analog phones, the old big old heavy ones, were not as scary. Um, but, and then you've got things here like not, you know comparison shops, so that you're choosing the low RFI. I guess return it if you look in the box and it looks horrible. What what's horrible though? How do people know how to judge horrible from not horrible? Okay, if you if you look at um, if you look at at the uh, SAR's specific absorption rates that we've seen publicized for cell phones so far, the Motorola StarTac 130 has about the lowest SAR, and the Philips Genie 900 has about the highest. But all of these can be can change by factors of two or three, uh, meaning two or three hundred percent, depending on the way you use them. So what's the lowest? Uh, the lowest is still the Motorola StarTech Which or is? the Microlite. Yeah, they're, they're, they're pretty good. What's, what's the number? Uh, it's point, well, depending on who you believe. If you believe the industry's number in the way they use them, which isn't the way most people use them, it's 0 0.10. Oh. So the SAR is quite low in that case. But um, others have measured that to be at 0 0.43. Uh, that's with the uh, antenna retracted. So again, it's a lower number than, than the Nokia 6160, for example, which ranges from 1.84 to 2.16. Mm -hmm. And uh, remember, these are all numbers that are only good for adults because a child might have double that amount, that, that SAR. And again, the, the limit is 1.6. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, you know, yeah, a lot of these are, are, are actually over current FCC limit, and that standard is too high. Anyway, use an earpiece. Yeah. Okay. And then lastly, um, the last time we had you on, there was somebody that was working on a technology that didn't irradiate you in the same way. Right. There are still people who are working on chips that would be inserted into the battery of cell phones uh, that produce sort of, a, you think of it as a counter field or a noise field. And again, the technology is excellent. It really does appear to make these bio effects go away. Uh, they're, again, still in the, the pre-marketing phase, but people can uh, check on that product, which I think is going to be very good, at www.emf.com, www.emf.com. And that's, that's um, info uh, in regards to protective technology? Right, protective technology, a little microchip in the cell phone battery that you can use. You can buy one for almost every cell phone that is in use. 
mm-hmm. and just nice. put a new battery in. But it's not out yet. Well, I think they're, they're they may be marketing now. They're right on their yeah. cusp. www.emf.com. Mm-hmm. That's right. Um, and why don't you give out your various contact your in- contact information again as we get close to the end here? Right. Um, Sage Associates uh, by email. You can reach us at Sage S A G E at Silcom S I L C O M dot com. And a website, if you'd like, is www dot Silcom dot com tilde sage s a g e forward slash e m f. Okay. And there's one other, uh, Lena, that would yeah. I think useful for people. Okay. If you are concerned about your school, if you're concerned about lambs, and you want to talk to a real expert who's been through this, call Gary Brown. Um, he's with the Broward County, Florida Educational Technology Services. And he has done a lot of work on uh, land systems. You didn't. You didn't have a number. You just had mm-hmm. where he was. Oh, you do. I. I have a. a, a um, an email address for him, if that works. Yeah. Why don't you give? Is that okay with him? Oh, you bet. Okay. Yeah. He's just produced a, a, a large report for his school district on uh, a, land, a proposed land, so he can provide this to you. And and uh, I actually asked him if it was okay, and he said sure. Bring okay. It. Um, you can reach him at uh, D as in Dave, D L Help, H E L P, at bellsouth.net. That's B as in boy, E L L S O U T H, all one word, dot net. Okay, D L Help at bellsouth.net for information on school LANs. That's right, Gary okay. Brown. Gary Brown. Boy, is that helpful. Well, we're just about out of time. Um, you just, you know, as usual, we have to stay in touch because I have to know what the next piece is so we can try to keep people informed. It's disappointing to hear about how many large things that we're going to be around, particularly airports are, are talking about doing this, so we don't have any control. I know you want people to get busy and, and voice their, their, their disturb, you know, how disturbed they are or they're concerned or whatever. Um, and I think that is true, you know, to just contact everybody that you can, that you yeah. think cares. Well, when you see the new Bluetooth, people are going to hear this word Bluetooth. It's an industry designed for a lower radiation uh, whole array of products. Bluetooth is producing at about a milliwatt of power. Huge, huge. And it's going to be, your yeah. the distance there is about right. 33 feet. Yeah. Any, anybody within about 33 feet of a Bluetooth it's device. It's going to be bad, yeah. Be, you know. We're out of time. Got to go. Thank you so much, Cindy Sage. Lena, thanks so much. Yeah. I want to thank you all for listening. I'm Lena Berman. If you need more information or you want a CD copy of this or any other in the series, Your Own Health and Fitness, you can call my information number 24 hours a day at 707-874-2772. For a list of other available shows, information about guests, and news about the nonprofit and the benefits of membership, go to the website, yourownhealthandfitness.org. Your Own Health and Fitness is a joint production of Your Own Health and Fitness and KPFA-FM. The engineer for Your Own Health and Fitness today is Mick Milan. Remember, being informed not only protects your health, it protects your freedom. <laughs>